We welcome you to our worship service on this first Sunday of June and Holy Communion Sunday. On behalf of Santa Maria First United Methodist Church, we would like to thank you for sharing some of your valuable time with us. We hope that you will be blessed as a result of choosing to worship with us. My name is Allison Ferrari. I am one of the liturgists for today. The other is Dick Best. The flowers today are donated by the Chancel Choir in honor of Otha Jones. Otha passed away on Wednesday of this week after being on hospice. We will lift up Blair and Stacy and the family during our prayer time. We would like to thank all of you who donated rummage sale items yesterday and all the volunteers who lent a hand. We are in our last week of preparations. So if you would like to volunteer to help, you can contact Marilou. You can still drop off items during the week as well. Just notify Marilou. Her number is on your screen. We also want to emphasize that we will need volunteers next Saturday for the day of the event. Again, the day of the event is Saturday, June 12th from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. In news regarding our reopening of in-person worship, we still are awaiting approval from the district to reopen. We are aiming for July and the exact Sunday will be announced. In order to be well prepared on that opening day, we need at least 10 volunteers. The volunteers will be asked to sign in attendees, take temperatures, disinfect the surfaces in the sanctuary, restroom, and specifically high contact areas. We will also need ushers to make sure available personal protection equipment, such as masks, gloves, hand sanitizers are in place. Plus, the ushers will help with seating and social distancing. We will hold a training session for volunteers on the last Saturday of June, June 26 at 10 a.m. Please notify Dick Best if you can help with this. 
Next Sunday, June 13th, we'll be acknowledging our graduates. So I know that you will, want, will not want to miss that service. You are invited to join us for that celebration at our usual 10 a.m. premiere time. Following this worship service, there will be a Zoom fellowship if you are watching the 10 a.m. premiere. The youth are back Zooming at 7 p.m. today. During the week, if there are any concerns that we need to know about or have prayer requests, Pastor Bob's contact information is shown on the screen. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, is our opening hymn. If you have a hymnal, it is 127. All three verses. We would like to thank Carolyn Krantz for leading our hymn, singing with Jed Beebe accompanying at the organ. morning I am reading portions of Psalm 138. I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your unfailing love and your faithfulness. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. Yes. 
before you. I will shout, I will shout it to you, Lord. Oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Oh Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. At this time in our service, we share the joys and concerns of our community and world and also our prayer requests of the past week. As mentioned earlier in our service, Othan Jones passed away and he was in a board and care for nine months and then placed on hospice only a week ago. So we lift up Blair and we lift up Stacy as well as the whole family uh, in their time of loss. Oh God, comfort them. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. The Antonio family also lost another sibling due to COVID. The brother of Rosita Capitan Aurora de Guzman, Esther Valenzuela, and Larry Antonio, their brother Amor, passed away in the Philippines. It seems like when it rains, it pours, and so we offer our deep sympathies and prayers for the Antonio clan and their devastating loss over the last couple of weeks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Cliff Solomon was in the hospital recently over some issues that may be related to diverticulitis, but he is now at home. He is released and he is recovering. And so we pray for him that he heals and that there be no further complications. We also pray for Pam as she attends to his needs. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We lift up Marlou's friend, uh, Maite Aragon. Um, her, she has 
care of her parents in the Philippines and is having a really difficult time. So we just um, ask strength for Maite and um, to keep up with all of the demands and to care for her parents at the same time. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We lift up Jim Williams, Traveling Mercies, as he will visit his brother out east. His brother Henry is on hospice, and so we just uh, ask your comfort upon them as they reconnect and catch up and uh, support one another. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. So now we uh, list and name those who continue to be on our prayer list. Cheryl Milligan's friend, Kurt Christensen, Bel Kalangan, Jean Rigsby, Eileen Pickle's sister in La Ronda, and Eileen's brother, Chuck, Tom Evans, and Tom's sister, Carrie, Trudy's son, Steve McMullen, and also her oldest son, Bob Fleck. We name also Eric Holman, Esther Jensen, Jim and Suzanne's daughters, <coughs> Jamie and Tiffany Lee. <coughs> we also pray for Fran Motzer's sister, Chris, Derek Tinsley, Freddie, and Elizabeth Turner. Lord, in your mercy, receive these individuals that we place before you at your altar. And we pray for other individuals and other families at this moment. We take a moment to pause and to see their faces, to name their names, and to bring them before you at this time. Lord, in your mercy, receive these individuals and hear our prayers. So now we bow for our pastoral prayer. Almighty God, we give thanks for the season of summer. We welcome in the warm weather and more sunshine and longer days. We feel joy when we see the fruit trees blooming and flowers bursting and birds fluttering about. We also thank you for the opportunities of the summer to take some time for relaxation, vacations, family trips, reunions, summer programs for kids. But we also acknowledge that summer means life changes. And we lift up those who are going through transitions of graduation ceremonies, those preparing for the next level of schooling, those who are taking on summer positions, and those who are entering the job markets. So we pray for all of those who are traveling the highways and byways and the airways and are en, en route to new places. We ask for safety and protection and smooth transition. Yet as we take some time to enjoy these months, we carry the weight of many worries. As a country, we continue to struggle with political divides, competing ideologies, economic ups and downs, and racial clashes. We fret over our leaders being at odds with each other, policymakers who are constantly revisiting past policies, trying to overturn legislation, and creating much confusion. We ask for clarity and for equality and for the acceptance of diversity in our ever complex world. And we ask for peace in the midst of anger and animosity and hostility, that these energies and feelings be controlled and countered. Internationally, we see similar parallels in many countries and cultures. We hear and learn about abuse and injustice and oppression and violence and the misuse of power and resources. We are overwhelmed with global pandemic and global warming and the future of our planet. We pray for people on the move, those who are fleeing dangerous environments and those who are emigrating and those who are being completely uprooted. So now as a people of faith, we call upon you and we return to you and we continue to confess and repent of our waywardness, of our unrighteousness. For we seek stability and safety and consistency. So guide us along our journeys and speak to us and send your emissaries and messengers to bring us back to the right roads and the paths of spiritual service towards growth and good health. 
We pray for our church and other houses of worship as they are transitioning back into in-person services. Continue to guide us all to take proper steps and to practice safe measures. And in the meantime, grant us patience and trust. Individually, we humbly ask that you forgive us and free us from our impulses, our iniquities, our obsessions with uncertainties, that we can extend outwardly beyond our selfishness and self-absorbing patterns, that we can stay optimistic and positive and hang on to hope. So we pray in the name of the one who taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Each week, we thank you for joining us in worship. We also thank you for your offerings. Sometimes it may seem that we concentrate too much upon the financial. We must always remember that the giving of financial gifts, while important, is only one of the five ways in which we pledge to serve God through our participation in this congregation. Indeed, the question asked in reference to membership in this congregation is, as members of this congregation, Will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, that's with a CE, not a TS, your gifts, your service, and your witness? Look at the new banners which have been created by one member. Look at the plantings outside the building with landscaping being done by other members. Look at the dedicated service of the audiovisual team. Look at everything that has been done by people preparing for the rummage sale in a few weeks. Look at the way the books in the library are being cataloged so that they might be made available to everyone. If you have played a part in any of the items I have mentioned, or in many others that I have not, thank you. If you have spent your time, your talent, your energy on keeping this institution afloat, Thank you. If you have shared your witness with others, thank you even more. And if you have the financial means and willingness to support our ongoing ministries in this community and across the globe, thank you as well. When our friend Fran Motzer was in the hospital a few months ago, she was very comforted by this poem and this melody that came to her, and this is her composition. Yeah. 
offertory prayer today is written by David Bell. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, O God. We are thankful for your steadfast love. Worship is a time to offer praise and glory to you. We praise you by singing. We praise you through prayer. We praise you in service. This offering is a worshipful moment of praise, an intentional opportunity to practice hospitable generosity. We pray that these gifts may help our church fulfill its purpose. Even more, we pray that you invite us to use our talents in humble ways to help our church fulfill its purpose. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. At this time, Allison will share our scripture reading. Our scripture reading is from 1 Samuel, chapter 8, verses 1 through 20, and chapter 11, verses 14 and 15. When Samuel became old, he made his son judges over Israel. The name of his first son was Joel, and the name of his second son was Bajai. They were judges in Bershia. Yet his sons did not follow in his ways, but turned aside from after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. Then all of the ed elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Raham and said to him, You are old and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern us like other nations. But the things did please Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they have said to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods so also they are doing to you. Now then listen to their voices. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them that the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to his horsemen and to run before his chariots. And he will appoint for him, himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his grounds and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyard and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkey and put them to his work. He will take one-tenth of your flock and, he shall, and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves. But the Lord will not answer you in that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us so that we also may be like other nations and our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel said to the people, come, let us go to Gaul and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gal, and they were made, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gaul. There they sacrificed offerings of well-being before the Lord, and there Saul and all the Israelites rejoiced greatly. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Listen, everyone, and we will tell you the truth. You know he said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free.
shall we pause for prayer? <clears throat> Will God make sense of this passage from 1 Samuel? As we rarely come across this story and these passages, and may it make sense, may it uh, be applicable to our lives, may it be helpful and useful, and may all that we say and do be glorifying to you. O oh God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. In 1955, a movie came out called Rebel Without a Cause, starring James Dean and Natalie Wood. It was a film about these troubled teens in America, and it dealt with issues about parenting and the differences between generations. In 1990, the movie was added to the Library of Congress National Film Registry, and it was admitted for being culturally and historically and aesthetically significant. One way to read our American history is through the lens of rebellion. And we can argue that our country started with the spirit of rebellion. For the pilgrims who rebelled against English monarchy, they rebelled against taxes and the limitations of religion. They rebelled against structures that they felt were too confining or restricting or for some even imprisoning. So the rebels left England in search of a new beginning, a change of scenery, and a chance to chart a whole new future. Hence the seeds of rebellion are part of our American DNA and continue to be passed down in all of us. And there are some good and some not so good about that. In our scripture from 1 Samuel 8, it shows that rebellion seems to be a universal human condition. The people of Israel are rebelling, and they too have that history. Let's do a quick review. After a relatively peaceful existence, the Israelites grow in numbers, and they become a threat to Egypt and the pharaohs. And this is some 2,000 years before Jesus Christ, or more than 2,000 years. So to control the Israelites and suppress them, the pharaohs enslaved the Israelites for centuries. <clears throat> so God calls Moses, who then leads them <clears throat> out of bondage to the Promised Land. <clears throat> but along the way in the wilderness, the people have this rebellious spirit, and they seem to constantly complain and question Moses' decision and God, and even their own choices. Finally, after going in circles <clears throat> in the wilderness, they finally cross over into the Promised Land with Joshua. They then enter into a time period where they are guided and led by judges, and the judges govern over Israel for around 300 years. And there are 12 of them listed in the Book of Judges, and among some of the well-known ones you might recall are Deborah and Gideon and Samson. But in today's scripture, they are rebelling against Samuel, who was God's appointed leader over them at that time. And Samuel is part priest, part prophet, part judge. And he is among the last notables in the category of judges. Now, what issues did the people of Israel have with Samuel? And this brings us to chapter 8. <clears throat> According to chapter 8, <clears throat> Samuel had gotten quite old and uh, decided to retire. So in his place, he appointed his oldest son, Joel, as well as another son, Abijah, to serve as judges. But his sons in that role did not serve as good judges like their father. They were out for personal gain, they took bribes, and they did not practice good judgment. And so the results would be obvious that this would affect the whole morale, and people would start to get restless and ultimately rebellious. So as a response, the people got together and decided to demand that Samuel appoint a king. Not just request, but demand. And Samuel takes offense at this, at the demands. And so Samuel decides to pray. And so as he prays to God, then God's response is this. God says, they haven't rejected you. It's not about you. 
But of course, Samuel cannot help but take it personally because Samuel feels like the people of Israel are rebelling against him and his judgment and his leadership. And that's how he takes it. So maybe Samuel's in denial about the corruption of his sons and refuses to see and acknowledge it. Or maybe Samuel is having some senior moments or getting senile, and we're not so sure. In the next phrase, God says, but they have rejected me from being king over them. So in essence, the people of Israel have rejected God and not Samuel. Now this has become like a broken record for God. Ryan Nelson calls it a cycle of rebellion during the period of the judges. And the cycle goes this way. Israel rebels, God disciplines them. Israel repents, then God sends a judge. And things seem okay for a while until the judge dies, which begins a cycle all over again, where Israel rebels. And their rebellion manifests itself in their worship of idols and other gods and their partaking of practices that are offensive to God. It's as if they forget all about God and suddenly follow their own appetites or their whims or impulses. Now, why do we, or why do people rebel in general? From what I observed, sometimes people feel that their life has become stagnant or stale, which may lead to a sense of boredom, which is unsettling and unnerving. And so people have this feeling of always wanting to move forward or improve or increase or succeed. And if not, then they feel like they are failing or regressing or that time is wasting. And so they grow uneasy with that perceived state of being and state of mind. Other contributing factors could be that folks start to compare themselves with other people and see that others are better off and they want a piece of that entitlement. As if to say, I deserve what those others are benefiting from or enjoying. Or that they may feel somewhat cheated or taken advantage of or mistreated and therefore thoughts of rebellion start a stirring until it becomes an uprising. So then people rebel against leaders. People rebel against structures. People rebel against rules. But what God says to Samuel is that the people are rebelling against God. They are not rejecting Samuel, but rejecting God. I mentioned the cycle of rebellion, the broken record, and it's amazing that God is so patient, that God is so tolerant of all the inconsistency and infidelity and unfaithfulness. But God is willing to go along with the flow on this one, and so God agrees to their demands and consents, grants them their wish. They, if they want a king, then let's give them a king. Hence the old adage is, well, be careful what you wish for. But before all that, God lays out the consequences and sacrifices that will be demanded of them. And here's a list of what to expect from wanting a king. It's not what God wants, but it's what kings tend to want and do. So here's a list. Verse 11 says, The king will recruit your sons and daughters to serve his military. Many, too, many will serve the wants of the king and not the commonwealth in order to stock up on the king's riches. Three, their daughters will also be enlisted in the king's services, that's verse 13. Four, the king will take possession of their fields and vineyards and olive groves, and the king's servants shall have power and authority over all your possessions. Five, the king's offices, officers and servants shall profit one-tenth. Six, the kings shall have access to your servants and the best and the brightest of your men. And seven, a tenth of your flocks shall be taken from you. So in summation, a lot will be required of the community and the society when they have a king. 
sacrifices will have to be made. So as God is saying, since you are insisting, these are some of the conditions that will fall upon you. But take heed, God says, and I'm paraphrasing this a little bit, just wait and see, because eventually you will complain and you will cry out to me once again. And when this happens, I will not answer your cries. That's verse 18. So as we move to verse 19, it reads, Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. And they said, No, there shall be a king over us. So their rebelliousness is in that refusal. What is happening there? Well, God lays out the consequences and they ignore the consequences. They ignore the reasoning. They ignore the warning. They have made up their minds, no matter what happens after that, they don't care. And that's what happens when people are so rebellious. They don't want to hear about the costs. They don't want to hear about the consequences and sacrifices. They just don't want to listen. They just want their own way. They just want to forge ahead. Because in their minds, a king will solve all their problems. One person shall solve all their problems. Finally, God says, okay, well, go ahead and appoint a king. This is from chapter 13, verse 12. But when you saw that Nahash, king of the Ammonites, was moving against you, you said to me, no, we want a king to rule over us even though the Lord your God was your king. So now here's your king that you have chosen, the one you asked for. And see that the Lord has set a king over you. And if you fear the Lord and if you serve and obey him and do not rebel, if you do not rebel against his commands, and if both you and the king who reigns over you follow the Lord your God, then good. But if you do not obey the Lord, And if you rebel against the commands, his hands will be against you as it was against your ancestors. So God transforms Saul, who is going to be their king. In in chapter 10, verse 6, it says that Saul becomes a different man. And God changes his heart, and the Spirit of God descends upon him mightily in verse, chapter 11, verse 6. Ultimately, what happens? King Saul is successful in defeating the regional enemies of the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Edomites. He's triumphant over the king of Zobah and the Amalekites. So from the very beginning, the people of Israel have in their minds their own vision of a king and they impose their expectations of how a king comes into being, how a king rules, how a king governs, and that a king will protect them against armies and enemies, and the king will rule with an iron fist. They strongly believe that a king will make them great, regardless of the cost, regardless of the consequences whatever practices and sacrifices get imposed on them because they don't want to hear about all that. In the larger context and picture of a king, Christ Jesus, it's even more of a contrast how Christ Jesus recasts and redefines and revolutionizes the image of a king. God's kingdom is turned on its head and upside down. Because Jesus introduces in his reign, in his rule, his kingdom, which is so radically different from even the early beginnings of what Israel perceived to be their ideal king. Jesus defines his king, kingship, and his kingdom in parables. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God is like yeast. The kingdom of God is like a treasure in the field. The kingdom of God is like a net. 
the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding feast for his son. What we find is that Jesus' teaching is open and inclusive and dynamic and not in the traditional militaristic, monarchical, hierarchical, linear ways, but it is shrouded in creativity and mystery and that it is curvy and that it is earthy and sometimes messy. What happens to King Saul and the people of Israel? Well, let me give you a hint. They rebel, and the cycle of rebellion continues. You're going to have to wait till next week to find out what happens to King Saul. And so I hope you do tune in then, next, next time. In the meantime, we examine our own rebellious tendencies, our own cycles of rebellion, and how we rebel against God, and how we get disciplined by God, and then return and repent. But then boredom and the emptiness and the void sets in, and we start the cycle again. It's who we are. But it's not our destiny, and it's not our eternity. It's not the final sentence in our hope. So tune in next time to find out what happened to Saul and the people of Israel. Amen? Amen. Before we go into the sacrament of Holy Communion, I invite you to say your own prayer of confession at this time, to confess uh, your regrets, your uh, shortcomings, your sins of the past week. So let's take a few silent moments. Lord, receive our frailties and our failures, and we confess before you, and strengthen us to repent. And so we trust that if we confess our sins before you, that you are faithful and just, and you are forgive us, you will forgive us of our sins. So in the name of Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Shall we begin with the liturgy? The Lord is with us wherever we are, whether it's here in this church or in our homes or in the privacy of our rooms in maybe a care center, whether we're with family <clears throat> or a friend or caregiver or simply by ourselves in our shelter or as Psalm 30, 139 says, when we sit or when we rise up in the wings of the dawn, in the remotest part of the sea, or even if we make our beds in shoal, both near and far, God is with us. So believing and trusting in that presence, we lift up our hearts to the Lord, for it is right and to give our thanks and praise. Since the early dawn of creation and centuries and communities have passed, we have been sinful and unfaithful in our humanity throughout our history. Yet, gracious God, you have stayed steadfast in your love yesterday today and tomorrow, and all the days that shall follow and throughout your redeeming acts. Through the ongoing story and history of salvation, Jesus has become central to us and continues to be. He took upon himself the suffering and sacrifice as an example to all generations, for he drew to himself the lost and lonely, the foreigner and forgotten, the outcast and the rejected, and, and even us who are searching for the way and the truth and the life. He was crucified, yet he rose from the grave to further salvation. And so now we join with the saints in heaven and earth, and we glorify your name, and we offer the words of that unending hymn. And you can say this with me. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. That night, as an example to his disciples, Jesus took bread. And he gave thanks. And he broke the bread. <clears throat> and he gave it to his disciples and said, This is my body, which is given for you. 
Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink, do this in remembrance of me. <clears throat> so now we remember <clears throat> your mighty acts in Jesus Christ and offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. For we acknowledge that Christ has died and Christ has risen and Christ will come again. Almighty God, pour forth your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Extend your spirit to those who have placed their bread and wine in their cups in the privacy of their homes at this very moment. May that bread and all that's in with it, within their cups before you represent the body and blood of Christ, that your grace and power and mercy is mysteriously present in these elements. We call upon your strength that we may have courage to confront the face of death, that we may endure the trials and tribulations, that we may be aligned with the hungry and the hurting and the afflicted and the oppressed, and that we may all experience deliverance and transformation in this life and in the life to come. The United Methodist Church practices open table and open communion. This means that as Christ opened himself to people of all ages and races and nations, that wherever you are in your spiritual journey, you are welcome to Christ's feast. And so taste and see that the Lord is good and be thankful. <clears throat> So at this time, you may take a piece of bread, and if you are with others, you may distribute it uh, to those among you. Take and eat and feast on him in your soul. And now you may take the cup and distribute it to those who are with you. And you may drink and be filled and nourished with God's sustenance. Now let's pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, thank you for filling us and nourishing us with your good gifts. Help our lives to be a sacrament to this broken world. And may we be empowered with strength and courage to go forth and witness in your world. Through Christ our Savior. Amen. Shall we join together in our closing hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness, and we will sing only verses 1 and 2, if you have a hymnal, it's number 140.
Thank you for joining us uh, on this day and for worshiping with us. And once again, make sure to watch all the way through. And a reminder again, next Sunday will be our recognition of our graduates. And so we hope uh, you join us then. And so receive the final blessing. The living Christ go with you, before you to show you the way, behind you to encourage you, above you to watch over you, beside you to befriend you, and within you to give you peace, now and forever. Amen. Thank you.